Further adjustments to the GRK profile kept coming, as does the information from the investigation. The crime scene further reflects that the offender at this particular point in the investigation is not seeking power or recognition or publicity, as he is not displaying his victims after he kills them. He does not want his victims to be found, and if they are eventually found, he has the mental facilities to understand that items of evidentiary value become of the bodies being placed in the river will not be found. The offender is very familiar with the areas where the victims are disposed, does not seek publicity, and demonstrates no remorse. From the medical examiner's reports and autopsy reports, it's learned that the victims die from some sort of asphyxia. In some of the cases, the offender leaves a ligature around the neck where, in other cases, none is evident. The primary element that surged with each victim is that the subject is not planning to kill his victims each night as he sets out to the area where the victims solicit sexual favors. He does not bring a rape or murder kit with him, nor does he plan to put his victims through some sort of ritual sex act or body positioning. We learn the offender commits post-mortem acts on two of the victims, that with placing pyramid rocks in the vaginal canal, and by doing this act, the offender reveals further elements of his personality. The offender is profiled basically as a psychopathic personality in that the offender is mobile, drives a vehicle quite a bit. The vehicle, according to the profile, will be conservative in make and model. Offenders of this type favor vans or four-door conservative automobiles. These vehicles will be a minimum of three years old and will probably not be well maintained. The offender, in all probability, has a prior criminal or psychological history, comes from a family with a background that includes marital discord between his mother and father, and in all probability was raised by a single parent. Thus affecting relationships later in life, he has dated and in all likelihood, if he has been married, he is separated or divorced at the time. He does not have, nor has he ever had, an aversion toward women. He is drawn to the vicinity where there is open prostitution because of a recent failure with an other significant woman in his life, and in all probability, he has been dumped by women for another man. He seeks prostitutes because he is not the type of individual who can hustle women in a bar. He does not have any fancy line of speech as he is basically shy and has a very strong personal feeling of inadequacy. Having sex with those victims may be the initial aim of the subject, but when the conversation turns to play for pay, this causes flashbacks in his mind to uncomfortable times he has had in the past with women. These memories, as stated, are not pleasant. The straightforwardness of prostitutes is very threatening to him. They demonstrate too much power and control over him because of his personal feelings towards women and the action of prostitutes that will make him mentally comfortable to kill them. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight, we continue our dive into the victim list of the Green River Killer. It's the spring of 83, and the GRK is in the midst of another cluster kill. His desire to kill is growing more and more, and the challenges he provides are even more rewarding when he completes them. Gary is turning into a cluster killer by the very definition, murdering that goes on for days, weeks, and sometimes months. Then he goes dormant for some weeks before he comes back with even more knowledge and even more cunningness. His goal to hide his victims and have their remains being his dirty little secret, but it won't be long before the arrogance gets him and places him right into the crosshairs of the task force whose only job is hunting him down. Warning, this episode contains graphic detail of sex, 
murder, and adult language. Listener's discretion is advised. If you feel that any of this may be too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you. Good evening, my true crime nerds. I hope you've all had a chance to hear last week's episode. If not, I recommend going back and listening to episodes one and two before listening to tonight's episode as we are in the final series for season three. And this is a big case with 49 victims. Don't forget, you can always head over to the truecrimelibrarian.com and make a contribution to the show. No donation is too big or too small, as it all goes right back into the show to keep bringing you the cases you want to hear by yours truly. Thanksgiving is just about here, which means time with the family being grateful for all that you have and the people you have in your life. I want to wish you all a happy Thanksgiving from me and my family to yours. Celebrate, eat too much turkey, talk too much, and just enjoy time with one another. What else comes with the big turkey day? Oh, that's right, Black Friday shopping. As you are looking to gift everyone that you love, don't forget about those true crime nerds in your life and maybe even giving yourself a little something by heading over to the truecrimelibrarian.com and shop the merch store. I just got in some sample items and I absolutely love them. I got in the long sleeve t-shirt with the cheetah logo on the back. It is perfect. It's lightweight, but it also can keep you pretty warm on those nippy mornings. I recommend heading over there and picking up something. And when you're ready to check out, don't forget to use the code GRATEFUL to receive 25% off your order. This is the biggest promo the show has ever seen. So take advantage, snag yourself or another nerd something awesome to unwrap under the tree Christmas morning. Don't forget that you can always recommend and review the show, all of which go a very long way to support TTCL and help us grow without it costing you anything. All it does is ensures that I'll be around for many, many cases to come. Enough of all of this housekeeping. Let's get to what you all came here for, the true crime. Last week, we worked our way through even more victim and watched as Gary evolved, changing where he dumped the girls and where he would pick them up along the strip. Law enforcement was building one of the largest task force seen in this nation just to hunt one man down. Their eyes were trained on the murky waters of the Green River that ran parallel to the strip as many victims showed up in the waters or along the embankment. While they watched the strip and the waters, they began their search for the man responsible for the senseless murder of the city's sex workers. On August 20th of 1982, I know we're kind of going back in the timeline, but this seems to be a little bit relevant here, and I want to make sure we get it in there before we get too far ahead. Law enforcement arrested their very first suspect in this case, but with the suspect in custody and Terry Milligan disappearing and being murdered, 
they knew quickly the first arrest was a bust. So the task force had strike number one against them. Well, then we get this guy. And if you know anything about the case, you're going to know this name when I say it. He inserted himself into the investigation pretty early on. And all he did was bring attention to him and away from who was really doing the killings. Melvin Wayne Foster. He quickly rose to the top of the persons of interest list and he did it all to himself. Inserted himself into the investigation, which if you remember, that was part of John Douglas's initial analysis. On October 13th, 1982, just three days before the task force was formed, Melvin made the very first phone call into the police station and putting himself in the middle of this investigation. Now, during the phone call, he didn't give his name. He didn't give how he knew this information. He just said, quote, haven't you people considered the possibility that a cab driver might be doing this? End quote. Well, he hung up as soon as that little spiel was out. So we're all on the same page, right? Sketchy dude calls the police, gives up some weird message, then hangs up. Not exactly the person that gives you information that you can count on being accurate, right? And if he is giving you information and into sketchy in this way, you tend to believe the complete and absolute opposite of what they just said to you, right? Because surely it wouldn't be that easy. Then he calls back again the following week. This time he talks to Detective Earl Tripp from the Major Crime Unit, and this is what he had to say. He said, quote, you should be looking at the cab drivers. They're the ones who know all these hookers, end quote. Then Foster gave up a name. He gave some information that could be helpful, and he said they should start looking into another cabbie named Smith. And it wouldn't be long before Smith kind of rose the ranks in the prime suspect world of the GRK case. And you wouldn't think that Melvin's word held too much of a punch. And it really didn't. The only reason Smith rose like he did to the top of the persons of interest list is because Seattle Police Department turned to King County and was like, um, here's this person that you should kind of look into. So, you know, you have fellow law enforcement saying that, you know, he could be he could fit the profile. He could be the one killing. And now you have people calling in and saying the same thing. Of course, your eyes are going to turn and be like, what is it about this person that makes others think that they are capable of killing someone, right? So they do. On September 3rd, which was a Friday afternoon, not long after Melvin called and gave over the name Smith, a worker who helps people at the runaway center brought in three kids. These kids had some information they needed to share with police. The three told the detectives what they knew about Smith and what they knew about a kind of sketchy dude named Foster. Well, Smith liked to take advantage of the fact that they were sex workers and sometimes he would have sex with these hookers that he would be driving around these sex workers and sometimes he'd pay and sometimes he just got what he wanted. You know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't agreed upon that that's how that would be taken. But Foster, his name, it, I mean, your ears perk up. Why? You know, this is the guy who sent us on the, you know, the path of Smith. Why, why is his name coming up as somebody is kind of creepy, right? Well, the kids told him that Foster liked to take care of the street kids. He liked to give them advice. Sometimes he would give them money and sometimes he would even have sex with them. Suddenly, Foster's name found its way on the list of suspects along with this Smith guy, but soon Foster's name would become far bigger than Smith. As a matter of fact, after some time questioning Smith with investigators, he did agree to a polygraph test in which he passed. 
He was a crappy cab driver and liked to take advantage of the sex workers he picked up, but he wasn't the guy that was out killing them. So now let's turn our eyes to Foster. September 9th of 1982, Foster was invited to the Major Crimes Unit office to discuss what he knew about this growing case. They questioned Foster for more than an hour about the Smith and why he felt like he should have been the suspect. And and Foster is only like real like why he's out the one why is he the one out killing all these girls kind of thing was that he knew that Smith would force these girls to have sex with him. And that in Foster's eye was not okay. So then investigators asked him, you know, well, do you have sex with them? And Foster immediately is defensive and says, no, you know, he's just out there trying to help them. Hell no, anyone who would have sex with a 14 or 15 year old is nothing but a pervert. You know, how could you even think that about me? Well, investigators are like, okay, if you're not having sex with them, then what are you doing hanging around these young women? And he says, you know, I just want to help them. He didn't want them to be losers for their whole entire life. And he even claimed that he spent nearly $4,000 of his own money trying to help these women out. Foster then gave up something important. He admitted he had been to prison in his earlier life, but he had been out of trouble in his eyes since 1965. Well, as soon as he leaves this questioning and kind of educational moment, investigators pull his criminal history. Of course, that's what they're going to do. We need to know what did you go to prison for? And now whether or not what that crime was that he did serve time for, I don't know. I'm sure if I, you know, was out there just digging, 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 and, and could only chase that lead, I'd eventually figure out why. But as it pertains to the case, it's not relevant because I don't think it came up as an assault, which we would be looking for thanks to Douglas's analysis. So had that been something that caught investigators' eyes, I'm pretty sure we would have seen that information come up with Foster and who he is, but it didn't. With Smith's name no longer on, of any interest to the investigators, his polygraph came back clean. And at the time, we know now, we know polygraphs are bullshit. Sometimes they pass them and they, you know, are the ones that are guilty. And sometimes they fail them and they had nothing to do with it. Smith passed it. And to the investigators, clean slate. See you later. We're now looking at Melvin Foster as priority number one. Well, come October... They just, they have Mel under 24 hour surveillance and he was beginning to see that they were looking at him at his, in his direction and not anywhere else. And this kind of pissed him off because his intentions were simply to try and help them figure out who was killing these women and catch him before he could hurt anyone else. That's how he comes across. So he's trying to clear his name and he goes back in for some questioning and they start to ask him you know do you know this victim do you know this victim and he does admit to knowing Deborah Bonner but the rest of them do not look familiar well Richter and Lamora of the Green River Task Force they get their hands on him and they get him to agree to a polygraph test so they hook him up and they start asking him questions do you know Cofield do you know Chapman? Do you know Hines? Do you know Mills? And slowly he begins to reveal he knows more than just Bonner. So they ask, why did you kill these women? The women that we found, you know, why would you do it? But he adamantly sticks to, I didn't do it. This isn't me. You're looking at the wrong guy kind of thing. Whatever. Half an hour in, they're done with questioning and they take the machine off of him and put him in a room and they're going to come back in and talk to him about the findings of the test. Um, and in his polygraph, in the findings, they do see that he lied on four different 
questions and they had concerns because of those lies. Melvin continues to insist that he was the wrong guy, that he was not the one out there killing these women. He, you know, he was like, I have nothing to hide. Go, go search my house. Go do whatever you need to do. Well, they're like, oh yeah, we're, we're going to go search your house. And they go have a look around, but there's nothing in there that comes off as um, questionable and Ultimately, they turn up empty-handed. Well, once he realizes that he's more than just a person of interest, he's their number one suspect, he decides to shut off communication. He's had enough. He needs a lawyer. You know, he's not going to be railroaded. Well, they go, well, you can end the conversation, yes, but you're not going home because you have a warrant out for your arrest. And they were able to detain him and let him see the judge and clear all that up on that warrant. So they may not have been able to arrest him for the murder of these women, but they were going to hold him on something they knew was solid. And hopefully that would give them time to find something to tie him to this case. But in the end, they don't find anything. And... Melvin's done playing cat and mouse with them and he goes to the media and he's like, look, these people have zeroed in on me. They're not looking for the person killing your kid or killing your sister or whatever. They're trying to make me to be the bad guy when the real guy is out there getting away with it. And, you know, he says, I wish I knew who it was so I could tell you who it was. If it was me, I wish it was me and it would be all over, but it's not me. You have the wrong guy. And investigators think, mm, I don't think we do. So you're going to be out. You're going to be kind of a free man, even though we're going to have you underneath our thumb until we can build a case that is solid against you. Well, while all eyes are trained on Melvin, victim number 18 goes missing. Alma Ann Smith was born on August 1st, 1964, and she was just 19 years old when she was last seen alive, March 3rd, 1983, around the 9 p.m. hour. She was just outside the Red Lion Inn at 188th Street in Pacific Highway South. Alma and her roommate were turning some tricks at this corner, and they were doing so together and trying to look out for one another because for a lot of these women, this was their livelihood. This is how they made ends meet from day to day. And going out and getting a job and waiting a week or two weeks or three until they receive a paycheck it just can't happen. They don't have that kind of time. They need money today, tonight. And so in an effort to kind of combat what's going on with GRK, they start working together in groups. These women, the thing is, this money was easy and the risk is great. The risk is their life, right? But the money is easy. And like I said, they don't have, a lot of them didn't have a cushion. A lot of them didn't have other income and they needed, you know, to pay for their room that night. And some of them though, they're working to feed the drug habit that they have and others are working to keep their pimps happy because at this point in time, those who do have pimps are losing a good percentage of what they're earning so you know and they're the one doing all the work so do you you know do you make just enough to pay him and then have no money do you keep working we all see that risk right we're all looking at it going it's not worth it but in these women's eyes it is it has to be worth it because that's the only way they can get a breath above the water, right? Well, Alma's roommate, she takes a date and she goes out and turns this trick. And it took her about 40 minutes. And when she returned to the corner, Alma was gone. A bystander that was kind of standing around told the roommate that 
A John she went on a date with, his truck matched the description of a blue pickup, the same pickup that had recently been used when Gary went hunting that belongs to his brother. Well, the roommate hangs around the corner, turning down John's and turning down some dates, waiting for Alma to get back until she knew that her friend was okay. Well, Gary comes back to that same corner he picked Alma up from, and he's looking to get another date. He was able to take Alma home, kill her, take her to Star Lake, and dump her body. This was a very clean killing. There wasn't any surprise attack. There was no struggling. There was no convincing her. None of that. It went as smoothly as he could have hoped for. And he has this desire to do two women in one night. So he comes back around. Well, there's Alma's roommate waiting for her at the corner. And Gary decides to reach out and see if she would like a date. He, she ad she turns Gary down. You know, she wants, she's waiting for Alma. But it doesn't register that he is the person that took her friend. And how does she accepted his date that night? She would have found herself with the same fate as Alma. This really kind of pissed Gary off because he wanted to kill two women this night. And he was having a hard time picking up a second date. The roommate would later identify Gary in a lineup nearly three years after Alma disappears. Victim number 19 is Dolores Laverne Williams, and she was born June 29, 1965. Dolores worked the same street corner as Alma out in front of the Red Line Inn at 188th and South Pack Highway. She went missing sometime between the 8th and the 17th of March. The date on her official disappearance is unclear but her official death date of death is listed as March 9th. So we could go ahead and say he, she was probably picked up on the 8th. However, because we don't have anybody reliable saying this is the last time we've seen her, there is a guesstimate in when she was when she disappeared and when she died. She was just 17 years old when Gary picked her up for a date. Her friends figured that she had found a better stretch to work somewhere, making a little bit more money. Apparently, it was kind of slow right there in front of that red line in that night. And so nobody really thought twice when she didn't come back. Well, because they didn't think twice, we have very little to go on with Dolores Williams. Victim number 20 is Gail Lynn Matthews, and she was born February 5th, 1959. She would go missing from the strip on April 10th, 1983, just four weeks after Gary took Dolores Williams. He was out hunting again. Gail is one of the oldest victims taken during this cluster, and she was just 23 years old. Gail had been married prior to her murder, but the relationship was either separated or she was just freshly divorced. She was now living with a new boyfriend around at the time that she was last seen, and he saw her around 6 p.m. She said she was going to go out, earn some more money, enough for them to keep their hotel room for another night. And when he saw Gail, she was sitting in the passenger seat of a pickup truck that he described as pastel green, greenish, and blue with a canopy. He waved at her, but she didn't wave back. He said it looked like she was looking at him, but she wasn't paying attention. That blink-like stare was going on. The boyfriend said that she was sitting quite far over from the man in the truck. And so he gets in his vehicle and he chases after them. But Gail and the man that she went to turn a trick with were gone. Once he lost the truck, he went back to the VIP tavern. This is where Gail was working and the last place that 
he had seen her and he sat waiting for her to come back from the date. And when she didn't, he picked up the phone and called 911 and reported her missing. Victim number 21 is Andrea Marion Childers, and she was born March 29, 1964. On April 14, 1983, Andrea was just 19 years old when she would be last seen. She was at the Seattle bus stop at 21st in Union, and people say that she was on her way to South Center Mall for that day. Andrea was known to be a sex worker. She had just been arrested for prostitution just a month prior to her disappearance. Gary picked Andrea up, and the two agreed on the terms of their date, and they went to a secluded area in the South Airport location. He had sex with Andrea, and then he strangled her. We later learn Andrea defecated on herself when she died, and Gary cleaned her up. Then he took her clothing and her jewelry. He dragged her to a spot that he thought would be the perfect place to bury her and started the task of digging her grave. However, he realized soon that he could be seen from where he was at by other people, and he feared getting caught, so he shovels the dirt back into the hole that he's dug, and he lays the sod back down and drags Andrea's body to the east about 50 more yards and laid her close to some blackberry bushes. Then he proceeded to cover her body with dead brush, tree limbs, and other garbage he found in the area. Here's the thing. Gary learned something fairly quickly when he... Um, switched up disposal sites and methods. When he buried the victims, he made, he took great effort to take sod. And most of us know what sod is. It's pre-grown grass. You roll it out on top of your dirt and you pray that it takes root. And then you end up with this really beautiful lush lawn. Well, what Gary was doing is he was scalping the surface and taking the dirt, taking that sod layer and peeling it back so that he could dig the hole, place the victim in the hole, cover it back with dirt, and then lay the sod. Why? Well, when you're looking for somebody who's missing and you think they've been killed and possibly buried in a shallow grave, you're going to look for freshly turned dirt. Well, if you lay sod over the top of that freshly turned dirt, it's less likely the person looking is going to see that. And so investigators have been all over this map. I mean, women are popping up everywhere at this point. And there's times that they walk where they think there's a person and they'll walk over the top of a victim a hundred times before they realize where they're actually located. And unfortunately, this leads to later when this case comes to a head and Gary starts to talk. It makes it extremely difficult because he has a list of at least 80 murders, right? He was convicted of 49 murders and in 2021, we added the 50th. So he's serving 50 life terms. He's never going to see the light of day again, but he has all these others that as part of his plea deal, he was to tell the truth. So he started telling the stories of these other murders. We don't have a body. And so with the task force, what their, what their end goal came to be later is to charge him with the things they could concretely charge him with, meaning there was no way it could ever come back in an appeal and say he was wrongly convicted of so-and-so's murder, right? We need to have a body. We need to have his confession. And the evidence between his story and what is displayed on the body have to line up. And then we'll charge you with their murder. And this just helps in the appeal process. And I know we talked about it last week and I will continue to harp on this. We got him, if just catching him with one murder 
and giving him one life sentence, he never was going to see the light of day again in his life because of his age at the time of his capture. However, because this was one of the largest manhunts in our nation's history, we want to set an example. We also want to make sure it's air tight, meaning they never have an opportunity to say that the justice system was mishandled and abused and they win an appeal and we're back to where he's out on the street, potentially capable of killing another person. So as I know a lot of you are like, well, we got him from one, you know, that's cool. Why are we so worried about the rest? First of all, families need justice. Second of all, we need to set an example. Just because you can kill that many people doesn't mean that one sentence defines the rest. You know what I'm saying? So because it was such a difficult investigation, I think it's very bright and intelligent on the DA's office and the state and all of them who prosecuted Gary to make sure they're airtight when they bring a new charge in, in order to keep his appeal options minimal, which means the chances of the sentencing being overturned, damn near impossible. Victim number 22, Sandra K. Gabbard. She was born March 7th, 1966. Sandra dropped out of school because she was bored. And now she was living with her very young boyfriend. And the two were barely making it through a night as they, neither one of them had a steady job. And neither one of them had the education to land a career style job. So they were literally two teenagers who dove into the adult world a little early. Sandra would be known as Sandy by most, and those closest to her knew she was selling herself to make money um, in order to make ends meet for the couple. And it was, here's the thing, it was easy. She didn't have to have an education, which means she didn't have to set through school what she didn't like. And in 40 minutes, she could make a lot of money. Sandy's mom really worried about her being out there on the corner, and she would often voice this concern to her, saying, you know, I wish you would go and get a, a legitimate job. I don't like the fact that you're out there doing this, and now we have this crazy man out kidnapping, you know, sex workers and, and killing them, and look at what risk you're taking. But her mom, she said she could turn one trick, take half an hour, and make as much as she would have made working at Kentucky Fried Chicken for two weeks. Now, you try to show someone the logic of getting a legitimate job, end quote. This is what she had to say about her daughter, you know. I could tell her till I'm blue in the face, but it doesn't match the logic in her daughter's mind. Nancy would last see her daughter four days before she disappeared when the two had lunch together at a Mexican restaurant on April the 13th. On April 17th, Sandy was last seen by her boyfriend slash pimp at the 7-Eleven store at 142nd Street and Pacific Highway South. Sandra was just 17 years old when she accepted a date with Gary Ridgway. Gary took her out by Star Lake Road. He carried her out about 100 feet away from the roadway, and it was kind of below. So the way the terrain was, he ended up 100 feet below where the roadway was. And then he rolled her down a small slope, and she landed in this small depression that was between a log at the bottom of the slope and the incline of the slope. So she was kind of nestled away in this log. Between the log and the incline, she was pretty hidden. He covered her body with some brush and some branches, 
camouflaging her with the debris and leaves to try and keep her hidden from anybody who could accidentally come across her body or from investigators if out in the area for any reason. Victim number 23, her name is Kimmy Kai Pitzer. She was born October 21st, 1966. Her Hawaiian name means Golden Sea at Dawn. Joyce absolutely loved the name of her daughter and had it embroidered on a lot of things. And she would say this about Kimmy, quote, she was very adventurous. She wasn't afraid. She wanted to see how life worked and never took anyone's word for anything she had to see for herself, end quote. On April 17th, 1983, Kimmy had just been freshly out on her own for about two months when she accepted a date with Gary. She was last seen downtown by her boyfriend. Kimmy and her boyfriend had gotten into this fight about their relationship and kind of what direction it was heading into, Kimmy took off and jumps into the passenger seat of an older green Ford pickup. Gary was desperate to kill two women in one night, and he had been on, out on the hunt for a second victim after killing Sandy, and he became desperate because he was having a hard time finding someone, and he really had this carnal urge to kill two in one night. And because that urge was so strong, he ended up breaking one of his very own cardinal rules of the whole shebang, which was never pick up a victim in the presence of a witness. Well, Kimmy's boyfriend saw her get into the pickup with Gary, and that was breaking that very rule. Gary agreed to with Kimmy on the, the aspects of their date that after the ordeal was over, he would take her home. And this was just so he could seal the deal, get her in the truck, and have a second victim. But he said, quote, there's no way I'm going to waste my time having sex with her, pay her 40, 30, 60, whatever, and then drive her all the way back into Seattle. That's something I wouldn't do. I would get there and kill her. I'm not going to waste my money driving all the way back, end quote. Well, Ridgeway got his way. He got Kimmy all the way back to his house. The two had sex, and then he killed her. He then drove her out to Mountain View Cemetery and dumped her body. Kimmy was left in the same place as Sandra Major, along with Jane Doe B-17. Here's the thing about Jane Doe B-17. She's an official victim on the list, and I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's one of the 49 he was charged with because we had a body, but because these women were known to have street names, and I doubt very seriously Gary wanted to know their name, and if they did say their name, he probably wasn't inclined to remember. So when we when the bodies were found along with Bone 17, we didn't have an identity. So when that happened in this case, they were listed as Jane Doe Bones, which is what the B stands for, and then a digit. Now, that digit is said to possibly be their age. It's said to be the amount of bones that were recovered. There's said to be the number in which the, the bones were recovered in. There's a lot of hubbub out there about what it all means. But in the end, it's just an identifying marker for the public to separate the multiple Jane Doe's we have. At this point in time, Jane Doe is unidentified. Um... She was found at Mountain View Cemetery where Kimmy was found. And a car, what had happened is a car went off the roadway where Kimmy's skull had been located. And the workers from the cemetery went to go and check out the wreckage. And, in, and by doing so, they found another dump site. 
the victim is said to be this um, is described as this 14 to 19 years old, white, naturally blonde hair, possible blue or green eyes, fair skin complexion, and weighing 120 to 145 pounds. Jane Doe has been unidentified for more than 30 years. If anyone knows or recognizes the composite sketch, I do ask that you contact the King County um, Police Department and give them information as they are still looking to close out this case in particular. You can find a picture of Bone 17 and the information to contact law enforcement on the True Crime Librarian's Facebook and Instagram page. So again, I encourage you to look at it and see if you recognize it or maybe somebody you know recognizes the face staring back at them. Victim number 24, Mary Jane Marie Malvar. She was born April 1st, 1965. Marie came from a pretty big family, but her family had no idea about her chosen career. They thought that their daughter was out there and she was being protected by her boyfriend. And in a sense, she was. But they had no idea that she was selling her body on the strip and her boyfriend was protecting her by sitting there with her while she worked and following her when they would go on, when she would accept dates from the Johns. On April 30th of 1983, Marie got out of the vehicle with her boyfriend and walked up to a dark truck that had approached where she was currently working. The boyfriend could see that there was a spot on the passenger door that was a lighter color than the rest of the truck. This description of the vehicle fits the description of Gary's then girlfriend's pickup truck. So he's using his girlfriend's truck to go out and pick up women. And by using multiple vehicles, it makes it really hard for um, investigators to pin down what vehicle belonged to him which again makes it even harder for them to identify who it is they're actually hunting. Now, like I said before, the boyfriend would follow Marie to the date sites after her and the John had agreed to the terms. All of this was in an effort to keep her safe due to the risk that's out there as there's a man hunting the sex workers on the strip. So the boyfriend's thinking, well, if something happens, I'll, I'll be right there and I'll be able to help you. However, this night, something gets in its way. After he follows the dark pickup down some way, he can see something heated is being discussed in the truck and he can tell by Marie's actions. He said it was like she wanted to get out of the pickup truck. But the driver of the dark truck turned around in a motel parking lot and headed south instead of north on South Pacific Highway. And then he turned left on to South 216th Street where the boyfriend would lose sighting of the truck. Ridgeway was living just one block south of South 216th Street on Military Road. Ridgeway took Marie back to his house where he killed her. Marie did not go down without a fight. She ended up scratching Gary and the scratches were so deep and gnarly. They left a scar in their wake. To this day, he has this scar on his body. He was able to reveal it to investigators during his interrogations. On May 3rd, 1983, Marie's boyfriend calls the Des Moines police and reported her missing. Now, this is several days after she had gone missing, but the boyfriend had kind of taken matters in his own hand, and he was trying to solve it all before he went to the police. However, he wasn't able to. 
on May 4th of 1983, he finally admitted that Marie was working as a sex worker that night and that she had accepted the date with the John she was last seen with. He describes that man in the vehicle as a 40-year-old Mexican or Indian male driver and the truck was black. Well, her boyfriend goes out and he continues to look for this vehicle because he knows this truck. And when he sees that spot, he's going to be able to identify it. Later, he returned back to the police station on May 4th, where he reported that he had found the truck when he went searching in the neighborhood surrounding 216th Street and Pacific Highway South. The truck he sees and is convinced that is the truck that picked up Marie is Gary's Maroon 75 Dodge pickup located at 21859 32nd Place South. This is the home that Gary lived in after the renters moved out and he was in between wife number two and wife number three. He would bring many women back to this home to be killed. So two Des Moines officers head out to Ridgeway's home that day after the boyfriend had been in and they questioned him about Marie. Well, guess what? Surprise, surprise. Gary denies adamantly about having a woman in his home at that time or any time before so. He also told them that he was currently unemployed and had been so for a couple months when in reality what was going on is he was on strike at Kentworth Motors. So we went through a period of time where he had nothing to do all day long because he was on strike. Now, as for those scratch marks that Marie left behind, he hid those from officers by leaning up against his fist and obstructing their view to see so. Once the officers left his home, Gary went inside and decided he needed to hide the fact that these were scratch marks. So he gets some battery acid and he pours it on the marks. Well, it doesn't do anything really when you look at it later. You can see there scratch marks with other tissue damage. After he gets done doing this really stupid idea of pouring battery acid on himself, he goes out and he decides that he's going to rehide Marie's remains. So he goes out to 65th Avenue South in Auburn to move her body where she was buried. He felt like the heat was on him and if somebody since somebody has seen him with Marie, now maybe it's possible that somebody's seen him dump her body. Well, Gary would spend several hours that day combing the area for where he buried Marie without any luck. He never found her. He eventually gave up on the notion that if he couldn't find her, that means nobody else could. Well, remember what I said? He was really good about scalping off the the sod and masking where a freshly dug hole would be. He couldn't even find it. And in all honesty, later when he's giving his interviews and stuff with investigators, once he gets back to the scene, he may not can sit there in inside the police station and be like, this is where she's at. But he was able to travel with investigators to all these different sites that he dumped bodies in. And once he got there, 99.9% .9 of the time, he was within 50 yards of where the body was actually found. When he goes through and he's like, oh, I remember this is where this happened. And he could get as close as 50 yards. Well, it was damn near 30 years after the, well, it was 20, 19, two, so 20 years after these murders are being committed, He's going back to these places and then he's able to recall what happened. He may not can recall their name. He may not can accurately recall what they look like, but he sure as hell can tell you where the bodies were. Well, if he goes back out there days later, not years later, and he had trouble finding her, surely to goodness, no one else was going to accidentally stumble across her, right?
Victim number 25 is Carol Ann Christensen. She was born May 22nd, 1983, and she was a single mother to a five-year-old little girl, and things were really starting to look up for her and her little family. On or around May 1st, she landed a job that she desperately wanted and needed. It was at the Bar Door Tavern, and she was going to be a waitress. The thing with this is it was close enough that she could walk the short distance from her mobile home to her work and from work back to the mobile home park where she was just a few blocks away. She worked during the day, but when she didn't come home on the night of May 3rd, concern for her safety grew exponentially. If she could get home, she was that type of mother that if she could get home to be with her daughter, she would have. At the very least, she would have called and let the person know who was watching her why she was going to be late. Neither of these things occurred on May 3rd. Now, here's the thing. We talk and I harp on this whole John Douglas analysis thing because it shows us the behavior of our offender. What it also shows us is the type of victim they prefer. Now, with Gary, he did not have a preference in race. However, he did have a preference in, in the type of victim he picked up. He was drawn to those who solicited sex favors for money. This, to him, made easy targets. He didn't have to smooth talk his way into gaining their trust because we know he was not socially inept to do so. So that is why he picked prostitutes. They are very straightforward and required very little finesse from him. Well, we have Carol. She's not known to be a sex worker in the area, but she did work and live right there in that 148th and PSH. These were his hunting grounds. The only thing that Carol was known to do that could be considered risky was she did hitchhike. So there's a couple theories going out that of how Gary and Carol came into each other's life. The first theory is that she hitchhiked and Gary saw an opportunity and he pounced. That is probably what had happened that night, but it doesn't completely rule out scenario number two. There is a theory that Gary knew Carol. Well, those of us who listen to True Crime on a Daily and know our serial killer trademarks know that typically serial killers do not kill people that they know. It's not impossible. It is rare. So had he known Carol, it is probably likely that he killed somebody he knew for the first time. Like I said, it's rare. It's not impossible. So had Gary known Carol or had he simply seen an opportunity and took advantage of it? I would say it's probably the latter. The former is not, like I said, not unheard of, but Gary doesn't speak about Carol in his interviews in some of the ways that he does about the other girls. So to me, when I'm going through those records, I don't get a sense of familiarity between Gary and Carol. Not impossible. I could be reading the whole thing wrong. But with his memory, there's no telling. Sometimes he has clear visual memories, especially if you take him back to the site. But for the most time, these women, their faces just blurred together. The only thing that stood out to him was the act of sex, the act of killing, and the dumping site. That is what he hung on to all those years. On May 8th of 1983, a family was out walking through the wooded area in the Maple Valley looking for edible mushrooms when they accidentally came up on the body of Carol Ann. There was something different about this crime scene compared to other crime scenes of GRK victims. 
something we hadn't seen within Gary and his growth as he settled into his role of being a serial killer. And it would completely throw the task force off of his involvement in her murder for some time. Carol Ann was found completely dressed and she was posed. She had two dead trout placed on her upper torso around the breast area. There was an empty bottle of wine laying across her stomach and she had sausage on her hands. Now, for those of you who are some form of psychology major and you have a theory as to why he chose this method of posing, please get with me because I'm not going to lie to you. Absolutely throws me off my game. And I read, reread, and read again, and possibly read even more than that of how she was posed. None of it makes sense. None of it. Of course, some of the investigators later say, well, was it a, a, a like taunting, can you catch me kind of thing because of the trout? But the thing that throws me is, what the fuck is sausage doing on her hands? It is so it's not funny, but it is so weird, so weird in comparison to what I have been reading. And like, you know, some of these victims, they just don't have um, a backstory to really tell. And with Carol, there's not one. She was a mother. She was trying to be a single parent. She was trying to do it the legitimate way. And then he goes out and throws the whole damn thing off by posing her like this. Here's the other thing. There was ligature left around Carol Ann's neck. It was a yellow plastic braided rope and it was tied extremely tight around her neck. And there was a brown paper bag over her face. Multiple reports talk about the brown paper bag over her face and some reports do not. It is not listed within the interview packet. It's not listed there. So I'm not going to say that's the holy grail of this whole scenario because it's really not. Carol's case initially was investigated by the Major Crimes Unit instead of the Green River Task Force because initial look, nothing about the way she was found, her history, none of it matched up with victims with official victims on the GRK list until they really started to look at her geographical reference. And then it was like a light bulb. She was working within the hunting ground. She lived within the hunting ground. It's very possible she was mistaken as a prostitute and picked up and murdered. And because she didn't have the background that all the other victims had and that's what led him to pose her and try and throw investigators off his trail i don't know it's really interesting that we have these anomalies in some of the victims and some of the the crime scenes because you almost want to say mm, that's a different person but in reality it's not it seems like he had a different emotion at the time that he was going through the killing and the posing of the body. There was something more or something less there. And you really can't pin it down because he wasn't completely consistent. And that is another reason he was able to elude arrest for so long. It's frustrating, frustrating. Victim number 26 is Martina Teresa Arthur Lee. She was born March 21st, 1965, and she came from a military family. They moved up close to Portland around 1968, and her father served in the Army. So, therefore, Martina grew with a dream of being in the service and having a career. And when she was eligible, she enlisted into the National Guard in 1982. However, following her six-week basic training, Martina was honorably and medically discharged from the military. 
Her dream of having a service career was gone. And it's from this moment that her moral compass kind of skewed and she turned to working the streets and taking dates in order to make ends meet. In early May of 1983, Martina was picked up on the charges of prostitution. Once she was released on those charges, she moved over to the Moonrise Motel where she would stay up until her disappearance. Well, guess what? Moonrise Motel in the hunting ground. On May 22nd, 1983, Martina and a fellow worker left the motel, headed over to PHS to turn some tricks. Sometime between the hour of 10 p.m. and 1 a.m., Martina met up with her girlfriend, and Martina told her girlfriend, you know, she was going to be picked up by a John in about 20 minutes for a date, and then she would be done for the night. When the date pulled up to pick up Martina up in front of the tavern where she and her girlfriend had met up at, Martina was never seen alive again after that. She was taken back to Gary's home where he would kill her and then take her body and dump it along Highway 410. He buried her next to a log and she was only 60 100 feet away from the roadway. She wasn't very far. He could not remember Martina's face. He could remember her disposal. So again, we have a victim that her face, her race, everything about her blurred except for the fact that she was a woman. He killed her and he can tell you accurately where he put her body. Our last victim for tonight is victim number 27. Her name is Cheryl Lee Wims. She was born May 23rd, 1964. She went missing May 23rd, 1983. She had just turned 18 and she was last seen from the Judkins playground. Her parents knew about a job that she had as a bus girl at a downtown restaurant, but didn't have any clue that Cheryl was walking the streets and selling herself for money. Her friends knew she was out turning tricks. Cheryl also had another high-risk habit of hitchhiking. And all of this comes together to being too high-risk during this time because Gary is hunting without restraints. He is seeing all over the news that their eyes are on this Melvin Foster guy, so they're really not looking in his direction. He thinks he's been smoothed by going hunting in several different vehicles. He's been smoothed by disposing in several different locations. He is doing this without any real worry. Okay, and for her to be out there to not only selling herself to catching rides by hitchhiking and being young and her parents don't know where she's at, it is just the perfect combination of chaos. We do know that at this time, Gary Ridgway was still on strike with Kentworth, so he was not working at the time of her disappearance. Cheryl would be dumped out by the ball fields where he dumped Wendy Stevens from last week's episode. She was our last victim that episode as well. She was also listed as unidentified until 2021. Unfortunately, Cheryl would go missing and they would not find her for some time. It is becoming very apparent as we work our way through this victim list that he is focusing in on one area in particular, and it's becoming his favorite spot on the Strip to hunt. It's located from South 144th to South 188th to South 216th Street. Girls were disappearing faster than they were finding them. And like I said, with all eyes on Melvin Foster, Gary was free to keep up hunting and killing as the need drove him to.
Those in the Green River Task Force were dumping loads of casework into the unknown pile of the investigation. Investigators were being overworked, underpaid, and had no genuine lead into who was killing these women. With virtually 24-hour surveillance going on their number one suspect, they were baffled as to how he was managing to slip his tail and keep taking the women walking the street. The only thing worse than not knowing how Melvin was pulling all of this off was that women were coming up missing, but finding them was seemingly taking longer and longer each time. When they did find a body, they were analyzing every aspect of the crime scene, calling in specialists to help them zero down from the behavior to what they were looking at and everything in between. Melvin fit Douglas's profile, but he was the round peg in the square hole. Certain aspects of him matched. He was throwing himself into the investigation. He made a living driving around. He knew the victims. He claimed to be trying to help these women. He was slightly older than they predicted, but he had the criminal background. Melvin had to be their guy. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight as we continue the dive into the Green River case cleansed by the water. Gary is evolving and has even had his moments and attempt to throw investigators. He was playing games with their heads and it was working. Join me next week as we go even deeper and the secrets of Gary start to pop up all over the city and investigators are forced to peel their eyes from the water and put them on a swivel. Their killer was everywhere. As always, I leave you with one last line. Be aware of your surroundings as we do not know who is there to build us or destroy us. Much love, the true crime librarian. <laughs>